It's a pleasure to speak uh, this morning. I've been very impressed by what I've seen this morning. I've been actually quite jealous. Um, we don't have such a fantastic equipment in my university. Um, EPFL stands for the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. It's um, one of the top schools in engineering in Europe and, and I will certainly convince my colleagues to follow you in the type of uh, equipment that you are setting up in the lecture theaters. Um, two words about EPFL, we have about 10,000 undergraduates, that's my job, uh, 2,000 PhD students, and it's a very international campus with people from uh, all over the world, basically. We have um, namely um, a large number of um, brilliant students from Turkey. We have also very entrepreneurial, like uh, Every year we produce about uh, 20 startups and uh, over the last eight years they collected um, 1.6 billion uh, capital, they raised 1.6 billion capital, so very dynamic campus. And when the MOOCs came, the massive open online course, we were among the first one to jump immediately on, on, on them. As today, we have 3 million people who have registered to, to our MOOCs. As you know, most of these people, you know, it's only one click to register, so most of the people don't go to the end. But still, in terms of putting our university on the world map, that was a very efficient um, action. Like, you see that about uh, half a million U.S. students, or at least students with an U.S. IP address, if connected to a MOOC, so it gave us a fantastic university, uh, most Americans don't know Switzerland very well. They don't know, certainly don't know EPFL, but maybe don't know Switzerland. And um, that was something where we've been extremely dynamic. We've produced 130 MOOCs. Uh, only a few of them generate revenues. There is a series of MOOC on Scala, a very popular programming language. And by chance, we have the inventor of Scala on the campus that explains why so many students are ready to pay a bit of money to learn from the inventor, from the father, instead of learning from somebody else. Um, by the way, on this thing, we decided to offer jointly with ETH Zurich to offer a free MOOC service, which is we offer um, um, the, the open source version of edX, open edX. So it is hosted on in Switzerland, and we can provide service to the. Uh, local universities because it's pretty heavy to to operate. Now, it's a bit like you. We learned today that when when the pandemic closed the schools, you were ready, and because you had already initiated this um, digital project, it was the same for us. On a Friday morning, the president said, no teaching today, all teaching online on Monday, and on Monday we were ready because we had this the teams being in place, both pedagogical and technical teams, and uh, they had developed in, in a rush, they had developed all the resources for uh, doing um, the digital transformation of lectures, exercise projects and labs. Uh, we organized training seminars on a Friday, Saturday, uh, Sunday, several of them, and then we complete next week to, to make our teachers ready. Um, some teachers did not like it, of course, but there was no choice at this time. Of course, you all know by now that this is not a miracle solution, that having Zooms all day long is, um, is a difficult thing for teachers and especially for, for students, because Zoom and then Zoom and then Zoom and then Zoom and then they do their homework in MATLAB or Jupyter Notebook or whatever. It makes you know 10 hours or 12 hours per day on a laptop. That's something that was not a choice. We had no choice. But um, it is not a surprise. Well, in 94, I met Tim Berners-Lee in Geneva in 92, 93, I don't remember. I, team, I, meet, I met Tim Berners-Lee in Geneva, the inventor of the web, and he showed me HTML, and so we decided to do an online degree in 95. Uh, but we knew already at that time that the fully online is very difficult. Uh, so we did one week 
on one week on campus, four weeks online. So this is not, it's not a surprise that the fully online is difficult. We see in the MOOCs that we have a high level of dropout. It's only justified when it's the only solution, when there is a pandemic or if you live in Istanbul and you want to take a course on a TPFL every Tuesday afternoon, then of course you need to phase a fully online. But um, the, the question is, um, today, we, we still want to keep some of the surprise. And the previous speaker said we might do the flipped classroom. Actually, 20% of our teachers, or at least 20% of those who replied to the survey we sent, uh, did the flipped classroom. So they watched my video lecture before the class, and I will use the class time to do something more interactive, not just Q&A, but something more interactive. That was a very positive surprise of the pandemic. Um, Another thing is many students organize themselves not to be completely alone. Um, so, of course, some of them who live far away from the campus decided not to rent an apartment anymore, and, you know, especially those who live in France. But um, many of them organize small working groups. And that's an experiment we did already like eight, seven years, eight years ago with a MOOC. We said to our students, if you want, you can watch MOOCs together. You know, we give you a room and, and, uh, and a beamer, and we try different configuration. Whatever configuration we use, they like it. Because EPFL courses are difficult, as you course probably, as any engineering school, our courses are pretty difficult. And it's easier to do something difficult together than alone. It's like running a marathon. You could do it tomorrow at 6 o'clock alone. It's easier to do it one day with 10,000 other people. So that's something quite easy to implement, um, to, to compensate from the lack of, of online interaction is when it is required to have no contact with the teacher, at least to have students group uh, watching things together. So today uh, we are back on campus. Uh, the vaccination rate, we are not allowed to ask our students, but since we have 90% of them who are in the lecture rooms and we check COVID passes when they enter, we can guess it's like you. We are about 90% of um, vaccinated students and we have uh, different modes. Um, we ask all teachers to keep using Zoom in the lecture because we, by law, we have to make sure that the 10% who do not attend still have the chance to participate to the lecture. So those who are not on campus, they must have access to the um, experience. So there are different ways to do it. One is um, hybrid classroom. That's the most difficult. So you have, for instance, in my case, um, two thirds of the students in the class and one third online. Why one third online? Since I said only 10 percent are not vaccinated, because I teach at eight o'clock in the morning, and some of them prefer to to come later. That's quite difficult because you have to manage the students in the room and the audience online. If you're alone as a teacher, it's pretty difficult. Many, most of the teachers will try that said never again. But there is a simple solution. You ask a teaching assistant to sit in the back of the class, to monitor the Zoom chat, and if there is a question, he raises his hand and he says, Pierre, there is a question, I will read it to you. That's um, the hybrid solution. The other one is blended. So uh, you have some weeks online, some weeks on site, the third one is a flipped classroom, I just mentioned it. That's three ways to combine things. And for the flipped classroom, some of my colleagues say, okay, in principle, I had two hours lecture, but since they watch a video at home, I will make one hour um, Q&A session with a student on campus and one hour with a student online. So that's their way to have a hybrid part of the presence part of the flipped classroom. And we're also discussing, we've been doing that, not without a great success so far, uh, to exchange MOOCs with other universities for credits with a uh, set of selected universities. Now, one thing fantastic happened during the pandemic is that today we have all courses that have been given um, in the last year. They all have been recorded. That's a fantastic knowledge base. And what is this graph on the right? This graph is a meta-analysis on the effect of video. So a meta-analysis means that um, 
in, in the literature, you find maybe 100 studies that compares learning in class versus learning in class plus having the recording of the class available. Mm -hmm. And you read these 100 papers and you choose the first, the more serious, the more reliable 35 or so, and then you analyze the data. The white line, the zero line, is the line where those who are learning only with the lecture and those who are learning with the lecture plus the recordings had the same score at the post-test. And you see that the mo most of the, the, the studies are on the right. It means that they have between one and three standard deviation, higher score if you give them the video. It's very simple. If in addition to the class, I can return to the video to uh, see some segment, I don't have to watch the first video, the entire video, but I have my contact with the professor, reach social contact, and then I can see. The average gain is 0 0.8 standard deviation. That's, a, that's on, on the final exam score. That's quite a lot, uh, EPFL. So you would say, oh, but how can I find a concept in the, in the video? So I type the concept there and um, sustainable development, and it shows me all the course, all the people, all the papers that talk about this. So you see, we have a lot of course that address the question of um, sustainable development. And here I picked one. And within this, this recordings, I can choose a concept, sustainable development. And it goes di directly on the moment where the professor is actually talking about it. So you don't have to watch again the entire videos of the PFL. You can hear, you, have, you are in directly at the place where he's talking about this concept. Uh, so we, we made an entire knowledge base, which is quite fantastic. And you can also navigate by a query, but you can also navigate by, by um, graphical navigation. This is in yellow, the set of concepts that we have in our environment, and in the blue, all the videos of all the courses. And um, so let's imagine I want to search global warming, then I will go um, you see the various concept of global warming. Here you get closer, water pollution, soil science, water meteorology, uh, biodiversity, and a bit, that's a bit too much, so I will zoom in and ask to extract the most important concepts. So here you see emerging the key concept, the, the key courses and the key concept of global warming. I can zoom in and simplify a little bit so that it's more clear. So one side effect of recording lecture is this fantastic knowledge base that we have been developing. Also, there is a philosophy behind it. Has been said my master thesis was about machine learning. Basically, it's about applying data science to education. Here, for instance, we see we do a um, simple regression between the grade of, of courses. And we see that's the thickness of the line, how much a course is prerequisite to another course, how much it is possible to get a high grade in course two if you have not succeeded well uh, course one. So applying data science to our own campus, that's the philosophy of learning analytics. We apply it to many domains. Here for children, for analyzing and writing, they write on a tablet and we extract automatically uh, the data that predict if they have uh, handwriting problems. And the data we extract as quite complex, like the second derivative of pen pressure. We don't have it only have the shape with the speed, the pressure and the tilt of the pen, but we extract features which are sophisticated, as I said, the second derivative of pen pressure, that are the machine learning told us this is the most predictive feature of this graph. Good, so we, I started by talking about digital tools, the MOOC, we went to learning analytics, Two words about digital skills. Like a few years ago, it has been decided that to train an engineer at EPFL, we don't have two pillars anymore. Math and physics, we have three pillars. Now, computational thinking course has been introduced for all sectors, including chemists, environmental science, architects, everybody. Uh, for instance, today, I don't know in UK, but we have 44 courses of machine learning because machine learning became the kind of ubiquitous tool. Um, Jupyter Notebooks became one of the most popular tools. It's quite interesting because it can 
cover a full range of pedagogical activities, starting from showing a demo, a small simulation, editing two lines in the code to develop a full machine learning project. So um, let me be back to finish my talk with uh, digital tools uh, to give you two ex some example of uh, augmented reality. We talked a lot about it, some people fear it, I want to show some examples. They're not from university level, they're from vocational education, but they will illustrate one point I want to illustrate. Here we've been working with logistic assistants. Pe people who work in a warehouse, they're supposed to learn logistics, but for them, they don't learn, they just follow what the boss says. So we developed this augmented reality system where they, um, we use a lambda that we've developed ourselves, where they will simulate physically uh, the functioning of the warehouse. This is my warehouse, this is where the trucks arrive, where the trucks leave, and here you see if they are too close, it becomes red, so because the forklift could not pass between the shells. So augmented reality is when you display digital information on physical objects. So they will build a warehouse, there are different activities, and once they are ready, they, have to, they can simulate and to see the performance of the layout that they've proposed. So here it is. So they will run the simulation and see the um, performance of the warehouse. So now you see the forklift, they take the boxes in the trucks, they bring the boxes to the shelves, and on the bottom left, we see the performance of the warehouse. That's an example. Another example is to how to teach statics to carpenters without mathematics. Here, the apprentice will um, take a model from a roof, he will go to his desk and try to work with augmented reality, so he has to upload the model in the platform. And my point, my point here is, what do we mean by augmented? And the first example was for logistics. Here, we want to see forces. So, um, this, is, this time, this is not beam on the object, but it's a see-through. So the digital information is added by looking through uh, the tablet. And here you are. So this is my tablet, and I will zoom in in a second. So here it is. So as any, so to learn statics, now I will place loads on the roof, solar panels, uh, more on the south, snow, snow melts more slowly on the north, so that these things can disequilibrate the structure. And once I have done that, I see uh, which beams are being compressed. So it is not to make engineers, but people who can intuitively reason, you know, you have seen 23%, 17%, intuitively reason on the roof structure. So what was my point? My point is that we call that reality, augmented reality, but this is not. This is not reality. In the real world, you cannot move shelf with two fingers. In the real world, you don't see forces. And that's what I want to, to, to come, and I have a last example of that for, for gardeners. A good gardener closes his eyes and sees the garden in five years, not a novice gardener. So this is uh, Joseph the gardener. He has to anticipate all the garden will look like. So for that, he, he sends a drone in the garden to make a 3D model of the garden. If he makes a mistake when he do a garden, he cannot come back to the customer five years later and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to move a tree. It's too late. So Joseph, send a drone, he captures a 3D model of his garden, he runs to his desk, and there he will do what a gardener would do, is to put trees and flowers in his garden. So now he's in his garden, and uh, he will go into edit mode. You know, the quality of image is not very good because we use free software to do that, but it's good enough for the cognitive fidelity of the scene. So here is Joseph, he goes and... Um, I finish in two minutes and um, plant some trees. Here we are. An érable, thank you. Some benches and so on. And once he is ready, then he can see his future garden, as an old gardener would do by closing his eyes. Then Joseph can see, oh, this is a garden I've designed. There is a bit of wind in the tree, and so on. That's still close to re reality, not a good reality, but close to reality. 
But what is really interesting, now he can go back and move the trees as, as often as he want, change the trees and so on. But he can do something that, that is impossible. He can change the season. Show me my, my garden in the winter, in the summer, in the fall. He can do another thing that is all normally impossible. He can navigate in time. Show me my garden in three years. Show me my garden maybe you know, in 10 years. Oh, in 10 years there will be shadow on my kitchen. That's quite bad. Then, then I should move this tree. And uh, he can even move the sun to see, um, or oh, move the sun, sorry. The sun, sorry, move the, um, to see how oh, oh my garden will look in the morning, in the evening, and so on. Here it is. Um, so, for me, part of the future is, is this. Is, we call it augmented reality, but it's not reality. What is pedagogically interesting is the difference, is how we can do things that are not possible in the reality. And that's something maybe that could inspire some projects on your side. As it was mentioned in the introduction, we have also done something quite nice. We have opened a space for eight tech startups. Um, we, I, I believe there would be 10, but we have 90, close to 90. About 10 of them die every year, but uh, 10 new come every And that's just in Switzerland. Now you have the same kind of initiative about everywhere in, in Europe. And I will stop here. <laughs>